My name is Silke Zollinger and I work for the UK Science and Technology Facilities Council. I'm delighted to run this press conference and guide you through here. So the EPS High Energy Physics Conference is a major conference in its research field, high energy physics. It's run every two years and by the European Physical Society and also by a, U, by a local organization committee which has done a great and a tremendous effort here to bring the conference to Vienna, which was done by the Institute of High Energy Physics, the Austrian Academy of Sciences, the Univer University of Vienna, the Vienna University of Technology, and the Stefan Meyer Institute. Today we have three speakers on the panel and who are happy to answer your questions and I'd like to introduce you shortly to our speakers. On my left is Professor Jochen Schiek. He is director of the in Institute of High Energy Physics of the Austrian Academy of Sciences and he is also professor at the Vienna University of Technology. Next to him we have Professor Rolf Dieter Heuer who is the Director General of the European Particle Physics Laboratory CERN in Geneva. And he will give us today an update of the latest results on particle findings. And next to him we have Professor Francis Halsen from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. He is the winner of the this year's Cocconi Prize for Outstanding Achievements. And this was done in the field of neutrino astrophysics and he got the prize for the discovery of very high energy extraterrestrial neutrinos with the ice cube experiment where he is working on which is located in the south pole so we will hear more about that on later i would like to forward now the microphone to professor jochen schick who is also the head of the local organization committee and will give you an update on the impacts of this conference for Vienna and Austria. Thank you very much, Silke. So I would like to give you some information, some brief information about the conference and also give you a, an overview of uh, our particle physics program we run here in Austria. So the conference started already last Wednesday we had parallel sessions and today we have plenary sessions. We have, as we expected, around 750 participants from all over the world, from the US, America, Asia, and also from Australia. The scientific topics of this conference ranges from physics about standard model, standard model physics, so this includes also the 2012 discovered Higgs boson, and uh, goes to astroparticle physics and uh, cosmology. For the first time, this conference has also a presentation dedicated to outreach and education. This is the first time I'm very happy that we have this here because I think outreach and education is uh, something very important related to our work. Within this conference, we also, the European Physical Society also distributed the prizes for the, of the EPS High Energy Particle Physics Division. This was awarded to five <coughs> theorists for outstanding contributions to high energy physics. There was also a prize, as already mentioned, the Giuseppe and Varni Cocona Prize for outstanding contributions in astroparticle physics and cosmology. And uh, we had also prizes for young scientists and also a prize for outreach activities. I would also like to mention that besides the rich scientific program, we have also an outreach program for the general public with exhibitions on particle physics. We have an art, and, uh, uh, an art exhibition and as well as several public lectures. Just some brief words about particle physics here in Austria. In Austria, particle physics is performed at uh, two institutes of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. So this is the Institute of High Energy Physics and the Stefan Meyer Institute. <coughs> we have the both universities in Vienna doing particle physics and the University of Graz and the University of Innsbruck. Austria made several 
or made, for example, leading contributions to the uh, construction of the CMS experiment. Austria was also a founder of this experiment at the LHC at CERN. And uh, during the last years or decades, we developed a very strong expertise on tracking detectors. These detectors allow, for example, the reconstruction of the charged particles and the tra trajectory. And uh, right at the moment in this framework, for example, we cooperate with Austrian industry to develop the next generation of this kind of particle detectors. This kind of expertise where we specialized on is not only applied to f experiments at CERN, we have also a strong contribution to the construction and the development of an experiment in, Yap in Japan, and there we have also the leading role there. <coughs> Besides this, we have also a large data analysis group with several PhD students, so we are also very strong in education. And uh, this group, for example, also contributed to the discovery of the Higgs in 2012. Last but not least, I would also like to mention that with my coming one and a half years ago, we have also now a new engagement in the search for dark matter. I think this is one of the hottest topics these days. And uh, we have a theoretical and an experimental group working on this. I hand over to Rolf. Thank you, Jochen. First of all, I would like to wholeheartedly congratulate, congratulate Francis and all the other prize winners for the prize awards. I think uh, they are all extremely well deserved and uh, I'm happy uh, for the nom for all these, on all these nominations. Austria and CERN have a strong tradition of uh, cooperation and uh, I think it's getting stronger and stronger, especially since one and a half years now, since you have started. On the Large Hadron Collider, which is the flagship of CERN, the news you know already, uh, it's running again since uh, roughly two months we have collisions. At the moment we don't have collisions, at the moment we have special runs in order to prepare the next increase in the number of collisions. So it's uh, testing the machine, bringing up the machine, giving some physics to the, to the physics collisions to the experiments, and then t testing the machine again, bringing the machine up in, in performance. This is the steps which we have to do during especially 2015. After two years of a long shutdown in which you, yeah, you touch essentially every part of the machine where you do a lot of improvements, a lot of uh, additional work with, uh, if I'm not mistaken, over one million hours of work uh, in the tunnel, you can well imagine that we started beginning of this year with a new sort of new machine. We have increased the energy, we will increase the intensity, and this all has to be done very carefully. We want to bring up that machine to full performance towards the end of the year, so that we have three years of harvesting physics in the next three years, 2016, 17, and 18. So what are the, re this is the first, I would call really very good result at this conference, that the machine is back up in operation. The other good res uh, news are that uh, we, hear, we will hear during that conference quite a few results still from the run number one, which ended more than two years ago. And that also shows you that you need quite some time to evaluate data, to cross-check the data, to check all the, the um, errors, systematic, statistical, etc. And we have quite a few new, new results here at this conference from this run. In addition, if you expect earth-shaking news from the new run, it's a bit too early. It's obvious that uh, after two months of operation at relatively low intensity, you cannot expect earth-shaking new results, despite the fact that we have already, with this machine now, collected roughly 100 times the amount of collisions compared to 2010 when we first started the LHC at its then record energy of 7 TV. Uh, but it takes time to analyze these data. Nonetheless, there are a few preliminary new results and one new result which is already submitted to a journal. What do you have to do with the new data? Well, if you go up in energy from 7 or then 8 TV, as in run 1, to 13 TV, which is roughly 70% more, 
you have to check is the standard model still valid at this energy. Before you can declare any, uh, any discovery, you have to, to show to everybody that you understand the data, the standard model at this energy. That's presently ongoing. And most of the so-called standard model particles are already redetected at 13 TeV. I wouldn't say rediscovered, they have been redetected, I would say. Okay, so we are all pretty happy about this and looking forward to the next few months of at least some harvest, but the main harvest will come in the years to come. So you have to stay tuned. Thank you, Herr Hoyer. So Francis, um, could you please give us a little bit more information why you won your prize? And for everyone who likes to see it later, he brought actually his prize here, so you can have a look <laughs> later on with it too. So uh, I was asked to introduce the field of particle astrophysics, which is kind of challenging because it's very diverse. So first of all, uh, we don't work with accelerator in Geneva, we work with accelerators in the sky. Our accelerators deliver higher energy. They deliver protons in CERN, you can get uh, beams just under 10 TeV. We have proton beams of uh, 100 million TeV. We see photons of 100 TeV and uh, we recently discovered neutrinos from the cosmos that have energies of a thousand TV. On the other hand, what's wrong with the air accelerators? <laughs> Their luminosity is not that good. <laughs> and so this is the activity in the field. So their uh, luminosity is that miserable that unless you build extraordinary huge detectors to compensate for it, you're not going to do particle physics. Uh, in fact, uh, we don't do just particle physics, of course. These beams also teach us about astrophysics. And it's amazing how little we have learned. I was in Austria three years ago, I think, to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the discovery of cosmic rays, or particle beams in the sky. Uh, as you probably know or should know, they were discovered by Hess, who was an uh, Austrian professor at the time. And um, so, despite the energy, what you need is huge detectors to collect events. And so the development in this field, which was covered at this conference, is to, to develop new technology, to build larger arrays of gamma ray telescopes. Our experiment developed the kilometer cube particle detector that detects neutrinos. Uh, people are building, have built air shower arrays that are several thousand kilometers square in area. That's like a, a small state in the United States. And uh, so that's what's going on and is our attempt to, to reach new particle physics by energy rather than maybe mostly by luminosity at CERN. Uh, This, uh, the amazing thing about this field is that at this point, 103 years after the discovery, we have no clue what these accelerators are or how they work. And I have the feeling, so I can be proven wrong, that with the, de uh, the development in technology and with the multi-messenger approach to this problem, we are getting very close to the answer, especially with the entry of neutrinos, of course, in uh, this trilogy. Uh, the other thing, now particle astrophysics is more than this, as you can see, you look, look just look at the parallel sessions of this conference. Uh, all the experiments I talked about actually are also on another mission, which uh, may even be more important, it depends on the result, uh, it asked me in 10 years and that is to look for dark matter. Uh, it's a, a major mission of these experiments to look at places like in our own experiment to look at the sun where dark matter has been accumulated since for billions of years and where it then accumulates and annihilates and in mo on other things it annihilates in is neutrinos. So we continuously looking like all these experiments I mentioned for uh, dark matter. Uh, the next part of the 
trilogy is uh, experiments that are doing uh, cosmology. And in fact, at this conference, we saw the first results of the dark energy survey, uh, which does cosmology the way a particle physicist can, uh, can understand it. You, you just look at how the universe was made by looking at where the galaxies are as a function of distance in the sky. Beautiful experiments. Um, and then there is the dark horse in this race of doing particle astrophysics, and that are, of course, the gravitational waves. And uh, gravitational waves are going to enter a new era of, se or era of sensitivity. And so they are going to take data, the upgraded the detectors, both in Europe and LIGO in the United States, are going to start taking data in, uh, uh, in at the end of this year. And so uh, if you ask me what I dream about when I dream, <laughs> I have the time to dream, I dream of the next galactic supernova. This will be the event of the centuries, not of the century, where we have all this equipment, see thousands, thousands of neutrinos instead of uh, 20 in 1987, we'll see the gravitational waves. Uh, we'll warn the astronomers that the, the supernova is coming. So they will see it from time zero, which never happened before. And so, uh, that's my wish for the future. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much to everyone. So this is the International Press Conference and we are running also a live webcast all around the world. I also would like to encourage journalists on our live media to send us via Twitter questions. We also try to answer them here. And now it's your turn also here in the room. So as you already heard, you can also ask about wishes and dreams and wishes, wishes. so <laughs> please, um, if you could quickly um, inform us who you are, where you're affiliated with, and ask your questions. Yes, in the back, all the way back. Hello, Tanja Traxler, Der Standard. Uh, I would be curious, could you sum up the highlights of the round second of the LHC? the uh, results by now. Of course, it's not like new physics, but maybe some highlights. Well, we have not collected very much data yet, so what, is, what are the highlights? The highlights are the, what I would call the redetection or rediscovery of the standard model at the higher energy. So the experiments uh, have proven that they can very quickly, with a very high accuracy, very, very good precision, we measure all the known particles which they had, uh, which the standard model contains. The only missing ingredient at 13 TV is still this famous Higgs boson because you, you don't produce many. We are sure it is there at 13 TV. Um, I think as far as, as, as we can be sure, we are sure that it is there, but we still need some time to, uh, to, to, to find it again. Uh, that will come in the next few months, that's, that's quite obvious. Um, so up to now, all the measurements show uh, consistency with the standard model. But with this tiny, tiny amount of collisions, uh, which we will surpass by a factor of oof, 10, 100, 1,000, uh, 10,000 at least, if I'm not. We have now 0.1 inverse femtobahn. We want to have 100 inverse femtobahn. So a factor 1,000, we, uh, we will surpass that in, in the next few years. Um, you can expect much more then. And uh, to add also what, what Francis said, I, I also have a dream. I'm, I'm not dreaming necessarily about the next supernova, but about dark matter. And here we are working completely complementary. Yeah? So on the one hand, they can detect it in the, in the annihilation, annihilation in space. We can hopefully reproduce it, produce it in the annihilations uh, between the protons, in the collisions between the protons in the L LHC. 
And that is a completely, as I said, different method, completely complementary. Uh, both are needed. We will see who is first. Um, and that is something which could be one of the main highlights in the next few years. Okay, Can I comment on this? Yeah, yeah of course. Uh, I should probably have spent more time on dark matter. Uh, of course, dark matter is taken, it, the goal is so serious that, you know, it's like bread and butter. It's something you do, you do it very seriously and you don't think about it anymore. You don't think uh, maybe we should do something else and replace the trigger by some other piece of physics. It's a high priority. In fact, uh, my own experiment started, its first incarnation started with, uh, with funding for doing dark matter. And so uh, there is also, also dark matter is a trilogy. And there are, uh, of course, experiments in deep minds to look for the recall of dark matter in large xenon detectors and uh, other materials. And so, yeah, I mean, the, the, the other dream is to see dark matter. And it probably takes all experiments to figure out what it is. Because seeing dark matter, even when we see all the signals, figuring out what we are seeing will probably not be trivial. There was another question here in the second row, the lady. In, in red, was the shirt, yeah. Uh, hi, my name's Shadia Nasrallah from Reuters News Agency. Um, I'd be grateful if you could tell us a little bit more, explain for a broader audience um, the significance of pentaquarks. Thank you. First of all, what is a pentaquark? Penta is five. That means it's five quarks. This is not absolutely correct. It's four quarks and one antiquark. Um, you see, in the, in the matter we, we know, we consist of, we have three quarks which form the protons and the neutrons. These are three quarks. And you need three quarks in, in, in that case in order to be, yeah, to be colorless. Quarks have a special property which we call color, which has nothing to do with the normal color. But physicists are not very inventive. They just use some names and some nomenclature which they can easily understand. So three, three quarks, with each with a different color, makes a colorless object. And that's a proton or a neutron. If you add now a fourth quark, then this is with only quarks, it's not possible because then you are colorful. You need again three quarks, or you need a quark and an antiquark. If you add a quark and an antiquark, they again, quark and antiquark are becoming uh, colorless. So with four quarks and one antiquark, you again have a colorless object, which in principle can exist. So that was predicted since 40. 40, since 64, so since 50 years. Actually, the main expert is sitting uh, to your right hand side, the lady in blonde, that uh, she can answer all your questions. Um, she's from the experiment which has discovered this, these two types of pentaquarks. Now, what can it tell you? I mean, theory has predicted it. It's possible within the standard model, so it is nothing yet beyond the standard model. But it would be nice to discover things which are inside the standard model, yeah? because otherwise something is still wrong with the predictions. So pentaquarks were discovered several times over the past one or two decades, and each time people had to take back the discovery, or others has uh, refuted it. Now this time, why are we now pretty sure about the discovery of the pentaquark this time? Because the experiment has not only looked on a single quantity, but on different quantities. So a, a multivariant analysis, you can say, a multidimensional analysis. And everything clearly points towards the properties as you expect from a so-called pentaquark. Okay, so this is why we are pretty sure. 
the experiment is absolutely sure. We are pretty sure. <laughs> well, as a DG, you have to be slightly more cautious. Now, what is the significance? Um, study of these, this type of quark uh, state is it can give you more information about the behavior of the strong force which keeps uh, the, nucle the nucleons and the nuclei together. And this strong force is, is, is very, very important to understand. And studying the property of this beast can give you more information of the behavior of the strong force and therefore on the way the yeah, nature works in the microcosm within with this one force. I think this is for, I guess, more or less for the layman the right description. Is this roughly answering your question? That's the significance of this pentaquark discovery. Next question, please. Yes, all the way in the back, in the blue shirt, yeah. <coughs> Well, we can repeat the question, yeah. then it's no problem, if, if we understand it. I don't think we talked about pentaquarks before the paper was submitted. Hmm? The paper has been submitted, yes, it has been submitted, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Tuesday, two weeks ago. Yeah. Um, <coughs> we try to avoid to be too speedy for you. Uh, press releases or announcements from CERN are coming all the time in coincidence when something is being published. We don't want to precede any journal publication. I think that's very important. This is also why our, the CERN press release comes out this afternoon because there is a, uh, <coughs> there will be a paper by one, by one of the experiments again, but the, uh, it's under embargo until 5 p.m. And this is why the press release from CERN comes out at 5 p.m. Okay? Yeah, in the front. No? Yeah. <laughs> so the question is... Uh, uh, the, I'm looking forward to the next supernova. Do you have any idea when this will happen? Uh, I, w I hope it's in my lifetime. <laughs> uh, I, uh, the precision, I mean, there, there, there is a, a whole science that uh, tells us many measurements that tell us how often a supernova happens inside our galaxy, because of course that's the one we are interested in. And uh, so the answer is two to three a year. Although there are many measurements, many indications, none of them are precise, and doing statistics with numbers like two a year is difficult. So, of course, the last one was in 1987, so that means that we'll have one soon, right, <laughs> if you don't know statistics. <laughs> but uh, the other way to go at this is we actually have ideas of how to see supernovae neutrinos in other galaxies, where you could say, be guaranteed that you see one a year. But uh, nobody has been seriously moving on that because we are moving on other things, unfor <laughs> unfortunately, for this subject. The fun with basic science is that you don't know when it happens for your side. That's fun. Uh, it's unpredictable, but this is nice. Yeah, the mistake is not to be prepared. Yeah. I mean, 
uh, I told you my dream, now I tell you my nightmare, is to have a supernova happen when the detector is down. And uh, I mean, I'm serious. And we have done, we have actually done a lot of work. We have a totally separate, in, on the ice cube experiment, we have a totally separate independent data acquisition system that is on 99.9 something percent of the time. So we're covered. We hope, yes. <laughs> The question was that I'm pretty sure that we would redetect uh, re another Higgs boson. And that was the phrase you, you used. The word another is wrong, that we would redetect the Higgs boson again, the same one again at 13 TV. Because if the, we expect that the standard model works at 7 TV, at 8 TV, as well as at 13 TV. Okay? So that means we have to find again all the particles we know already in the, in the standard model. We, we have to find them again at 13 TV, okay? And therefore, since we have found all the particles except of the Higgs boson already now with a small amount of collisions, uh, we are pretty sure that we will find the Higgs boson, the, this, not the Higgs boson, this Higgs boson again at the higher energy at 13 TV. The significance is <coughs> that if we would find something else than this Higgs boson, we would be extremely puzzled because then the standard model would not work. And we would have a different situation at the lower energy, let's say 8 TV as we ha and at 13 TV. We need something like this Higgs boson in order to give mass to the fundamental, the elementary particles. Now we have found again the elementary particles and they are still massive. So there must be something which gives mass to them and that should be again the same field, the Higgs boson, the field w of which the Higgs boson is the messenger of. I would be, I'm a Swabian and Swabians only bet when they know that they win. I would bet that we find it again. But I would bet, I, I usually only bet coffees. The question is, what would, mean, what would it mean for the particle physics, field of particle physics, if we don't find anything new at 13 TV? Well, first of all, you have, you see, the high, at the high energy, the more precise you can measure, the more information you get about the standard model. Already excluding, I mean, if you don't find certain signatures which uh, some theories are predicting, this is already a discovery. Excluding things does not mean that you fail. Excluding things means that you can, that you discover that this direction to look for is the wrong direction. You have to look into a different direction. So finding noth nothing what you call new would already be a discovery. Okay? The problem is when would you declare that you didn't find something new? This is a much more difficult question because it's not only the energy which counts, it's also the amount of collisions. That means the number of collisions you have. Because there can be processes which are very fast, uh, very, very frequent, sorry, very frequent, so you find it relatively quickly. But there are processes which are very rare. And it can take an awful long time to find these processes. 
So when would you declare you haven't found anything? So one has to have a lot of patience in order to really cover all the possible fields of theories or even not predicted uh, processes before one can say, okay, the standard model up to that, the standard model holds up to this energy and to this precision. Yeah. I would never be confident to make that cut. Yeah, I would never be confident. Um, I I think it's it's very difficult. I mean, I'm confident to make a certain cut concerning the prediction of a certain theory. There you know how often something would happen. Okay? However, despite the fact that I I respect all of our theory colleagues, they maybe they don't have the right theories. Maybe there is something different, something new. So that one has to go very open into all the measurements, into all these processes. And into these ones where you don't have a theoretical prediction, I personally would not dare to declare, okay, now we have, we have nothing. It's a very difficult subject. But this again is nice. I mean, uh, it takes some time. I mean, you, you need to people to, to look in special distributions and suddenly maybe they find something. Yeah. question is um, how does the duality particle versus wave influence our measurements at CERN? I don't think it influences our measurements at all. Um, the behavior of a particle as a particle or as a wave depends on the instruments you use in order to look at it. Yeah? You can look at the photon with a certain instrument uh, and then it appears as a particle. You can look with a different instrument at the photon, then it behaves like a wave. We look at the particles in such a way that we always see them as, a, as particles and not as waves. I hope my colleagues don't contradict me too much. <coughs> okay. So it doesn't uh, influence us. Another way of saying it, uh, for instance, the, the neutrinos we detect they hit our detector one at a time, so they come as particles. But actually, we know they have a wavelength. But their wavelength, I try to do it in my head, is something like 10 to the minus 17 centimeter. So for all practical purposes, that's a particle. But as an, uh, in, f in terms of astronomy, that's the wavelength of light you are looking at. In this case, neutrino light, but it's the same thing. No question right now. Maybe I can ask one to Jochen Schiek. You are the local organizer here of the conference. What is it that you want people to take home as a take home message? And also maybe what is the inspiration for especially young researchers who are coming here to this conference? So, so something which was discussed on Saturday afternoon where we had a joint session between the EPS and the Committee for European or the European Committee for Future Accelerators, there was the common subject which was called bridging the scales. So in particle physics, we're looking at very small distances, and in cosmology, at very large distances, and we are somehow trying to answer similar questions, or we have to learn from each other. And these topics, where you have these two different 
scales and that you have to learn from each other and talk to each other that I found very inspiring and uh, this is something I would take home. Yes, please. The question is if uh, there are any projects or serious considerations for a follow-up project after the LHC. Um, first of all, the first, the first goal is to exploit the LHC, LHC to its full potential, which means, given all the measurements, in particular the rare processes which I mentioned beforehand, the, um, we estimate that we should run the LHC, including some improvements, special upgrades, etc., to accelerate the end detectors for the next 20 years. Okay, that's our short-term goal, 20 years. Now, for such projects as we have in particle physics, and to some extent also already for the, uh, for the uh, um, astroparticle physics, you need a long lead time. That means as soon as you start, for example, data taking now with the LHC, you have to start to think for a possible uh, follow-on project. The, the, first <coughs> the first discussions on the LHC were beginning of the 80s, so that's now 30 years. So for the next project, we will take at least as much time. And you should not concentrate on only one project, but you should study, and it's not a project, you should study different ways to go. For example, linear collider with different type of particles, or a bigger circular collider with protons. Keep the door open, and then at some st develop technologies, because that takes time. The magnets which are now in the LHC tunnel, did not, or that technology did not, not exist in the 80s. It took canonical roughly 10 years to develop all that. Again, we have to do the same, and we have to look into the physics, into which direction should physics should are the results uh, directing us. And there we have to take together results from astroparticle, be it in space, be it uh, underground, and from particle physics, be it at the LHC, be it at other facilities where there's high precision physics being done. Take everything together, and then we hope that nature at some stage gives us a direction where to go. And then the best, one, the best thing is that you have a project in the drawer which you can then take out and, and put forward. Yeah? You have to have the scientific case, you have to have the technology, and you have to have an idea how much it would cost. Yes, please. question, if I understood correctly, was if I would encourage a, a student to study physics, is it an interesting field on for the coming years or not? Of course, I would encourage students to study physics. But not only for the next few years. It's for many, many years an interesting field. Where would you be today without physics? Yeah? I mean, take away, take away your laptop. Take away your microphone, take away in all this, take away your, your uh, mobile phone. Huh? It all starts with basic science and with basic physics. So it is an interesting field and it, it, you need physis, physics and engineering in order to, to make progress. So that will be, f to my mind, for all the time, at least during our lifetime, definitely, for many, many years to come. I, I can't see how you can develop with the humanity, the society without physics. Physics is underlying many, many processes yeah, everywhere in society. So yes, we need even more students to study physics. And physics is easy. 
Once you dig into it, it is easy. Eh? It's, it's just that first threshold, yeah? I mean, here we have a young scientist with a young scientist award. You would agree that physics is easy? Okay, he doesn't contradict the DG, so okay, that's fine. It is e it, it, it's fascinating, yeah? And people just should not have any threshold to dig a little bit into the questions. The main thing of physics is logic. Yeah? Then you need a little bit of mathematics, but the main thing is logic. And it's fascinating. Okay? So if you want to do a second career, study physics. Actually, I, I think I would answer the question the same way, but also, I mean, it's a question that I don't think comes up. If you are a physicist, you're going to do physics. You never ask the question, should I really do this? Because the, the pleasure of being a scientist, but mo all, certainly a physicist, is to learn things that you never imagine that you could understand. I mean, the, you don't do this to make discoveries. I can tell you, discoveries are painful. You lay awake for a year thinking what you could have done wrong. Uh, the pleasure of doing physics is to, to you know, understand things about the universe, about quantum mechanics, which was raised, about instrumentation. And anyway, we have no choice. If we stop doing physics, you know, Austria stops doing physics, you are an underdeveloped nation in maybe five years, 20 years, but you are not in the mainstream anymore. And this comes, yes, if you're unlucky, it's next year. And uh, so you have no choice. I mean, physics has to be done. And uh, the practical side of this is that uh, many of the good physicists in, in the United States, which is my home now, uh, they, uh, their talents are recognized as being not better or worse, or but different from engineering students. And companies know this. And so if the, the underlying uh, message of the question is that you may not get a job, that's very, very unlikely. There are no unemployed physicists. Are there any other questions? Yep, there's one. First of all, I don't think that uh, if you look on the whole field of physics, that's uh, of course much, much wider than what we just discussed yeah. on astro particle physics or particle physics. Um, I think uh, there's always the interplay between the experiment and the theory. Theory needs experiment in order to see w which direction to go. Experiment needs the theories in order to be at have at least to have at least some guidance which direction to look. Um, of course, you have to be open to, to, other, to look into other directions, but you need also some guidance. So that's an interplay between the two. Now, since some of the, the projects take time, they are statistically dominated. You need to wait. Uh, uh, the next uh, supernova could happen tomorrow. Um, it could happen in 10 years, so you don't know. The timescales are usually long, and theorists need this information from experimentalists. So as soon as experimentalists find something which they, which helps the theorists to, to, to go into certain directions, then there will also be new theories. So I don't see any, any big problem here. Yeah? Um, and it doesn't matter if you become a theoretical or experimental uh, physicist. It's each time it's challenging, but very rewarding. And I think human curiosity will never stop and should never stop. And that you can do experimentally as well as theoretically. But don't forget there is a huge, strong interplay. You have to work together. 
And as I just learned, some, some physicists become journalists. <laughs> so as a follow-up on this, I, uh, you know, about time scales, sometimes individual time scales become a bit on the long side. I just, you know, worked on an experiment for more than 25 years. But uh, if you look at it in the big picture, when I was an undergrad, if you worked on quarks or black holes, you were out of the mainstream. I wouldn't say you were a crackpot, but you were <laughs> close. <laughs> and look now, I mean, quarks, so this is one 40-something years. And uh, here we are, and quarks and black holes are as real as this computer in front of me. So, I mean, that's an amazing development you know, in less than one generation. No. No. In fact, if you look at the history of physics, physicists continuously, and I think we have been making at this conference, have this tendency to think that all physics is already known. They think that all the time, and it's never true. You know, you can go back to the 1900s, uh, the famous example of this. Yeah. I wholeheartedly agree with Francis. Okay, if there are no questions anymore, I would like to say thanks again to our speakers, Jochen Schieck, Rolf Dieter Heuer, and Francis Halsen. Thank you for being here on the panel. We have more time for one-on-one -on -one interviews right now after this press conference, so please stay here. We have also experts from all LHC experiments here in the room, ATLAS, CMS, LHCB, and ALICE, so please also ask them uh, for interviews. So thanks again to all of you for coming. Thanks for coming here for the EPS High Energy Physics Conference. Thank you.